blessing that was. Amen? Amen. Boy, thank you, praise team, and thank you, young ladies. You guys did an awesome job. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yes, indeed. Boy, you guys are welcome here to bless us anytime you want. Yes, indeed. And uh, we just want to say thank you. If you're visiting with us, it's a, it's a privilege, it's an honor to have you. It truly is. If you could fill out that card, we would greatly appreciate that. We'll call you once. We'll come visit you once if you'd like a visit. Answer any questions that you may have. But we certainly want to take a record of your visit and just say thank you so much for being here. We pray for all of you in advance. And we just pray that God will give you a special blessing today and that he'll feed you from his word. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter number 2. And then also find your way to Titus chapter 1 as well. Titus chapter 1 and Titus chapter number 2. Just want to say thank you to all of you for all the hard work that you guys do behind the scenes. It's a privilege, it's an honor truly to be here. Uh, and also, uh, Idlewild Baptist Church, Brother Ken Witten was the pastor there. He's retired now, and I think he's working for the North American Mission Board. And uh, But he was my pastor. In fact, I went to Idlewild Baptist Church when it was, I think, on Hillsborough Avenue. It was a real small white church, and then we moved to a high school then over there to Bears Avenue, and that's when I was in the military, and people would say, you drive all the way out there to Bears Avenue from the McDill Air Force Base? And I used to say, man, a church alive is worth the drive. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Boy, oh boy. Yeah, good old Ken Witten, man. I love that brother. Yes, indeed. And uh, I appreciate it. I learned under him. I did. And so if you have your Bibles, Titus, chapter number one, and we want to consider this subject, the practical side of Christmas and adorning yourself with Christ the practical side of Christmas, and adorning yourself with Christ. I know we focus a lot on this Christmas season, and we reflect on the birth of our Savior, and we rejoice in the Lord that he sent a Savior, amen, and that we have the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior who was crucified for our sins, died in our place, suffered the wrath of God so that we wouldn't go to hell and have heaven as our home, amen. amen. And is not Christmas... A rescue story. It's the greatest rescue story there is. That's what Christmas is about. It's about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? Amen. Amen. Boy, that's what it's all about. But we want to look at the practical side of Christmas because Christmas is to be lived out in our lives every single day, not just on the holidays. Amen. Amen. So let's look at chapter 1 and look at a few verses. Now, guys, I'm not going to do a deep dive into the book of Titus, but I do want to cover some of the highlights in this book and pull out of this book the practical things that God wants us to remember, some basic things. I pray with all my heart that this message refreshes you, revives you, helps you to remember, man, the simplicity of Christ and, and, and what's found in him, and that is everything. Amen? Boy, all of our hope, all of our help, is in him there is no hope and there is no help outside of the person of the lord jesus christ and so we rejoice in the fact that he was born and that he is now ruling and reigning sitting on the right hand of god amen boy he's in charge yes he is now the bible says this paul a servant of god an apostle of jesus christ according to the faith of god's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in the hope of eternal life which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Now, if you were to look for a Christmas story in the Old Testament, man, the book of Ruth, man, is a Christmas story in the Old Testament. Boy, it's got Christmas written all over it, amen? In fact, every book of the Bible has Christmas written all over it, amen? Because it's all about him, Christ, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the king of Christmas, amen? Now, I've got news for you and i don't mean this disrespectful but i'm telling you with all my heart man listen this world takes advantage of so many things but listen christmas is not about santa claus it's about our savior amen it's not about reindeer it's about our redeemer boy it's not about mistletoes it's about our master who's in heaven that's what christmas is truly about it's about saving souls man rescuing men and women from an eternity and damnation called hell the word of god says so man it's a rescue story Titus is the Christmas story in the New Testament that's very practical. God says this is what your life should look like if you really are walking in the Lord. You're filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. So he says, In the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but has in due times manifested his word through preaching, 
which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting or the things that are lacking, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Now he gives a list of qualifications for a pastor, but I want you to go over there to verse 10. This book is about showing deeds, the fruits of the Spirit, man, self-control, and the deeds that we do. Our life is to reflect the characteristics of Christ. Look at verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. See, these young churches on the island of Crete have false teachers moving in. Verse 11 says, Whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for a filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Look at verse 15. But unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and conscience is defiled. Now notice he's talking about their works, looking at their fruits. Many people profess to know Christ, but very few people possess the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. These are people that like to come to Christmas services on Christmas, and they come on Easter, but all the rest of the year they don't come. Boy, man, there's something wrong in their life. They need Christ in their life. Amen? The Bible says don't forsake the assembly as some have the habit of doing, but all the more, man, all the more encourage one another as you see the evil days approaching. And are not the days getting more and more evil? Boy, they are. Look at chapter 2 now. But speak the things which become sound doctrine. You see that word sound there? That's where we get the word hygienic from. Man, sound doctrine, right doctrine. Man, doctrine that's preached in its proper context considering all 66 books of the Bible. Look at verse 2. The aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and peace and patience. The aged women likewise, that their behavior be as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God, listen, that the word of God be not what? blaspheme God is serious when it comes to our conduct God is serious when it comes to you saying yes I know the Lord Jesus Christ does your life does your conduct does your attitude reflect the Lord Jesus Christ are you adorned by him and with him amen is he the ornament of your life that people see when they look at your branch because Jesus said I'm the vine you're the branch amen do they see Christ? Do they see his fruits hanging from your life? This is what this Bible, this book is talking about. That his word be not blasphemed. And then he talks about young men. Likewise, be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptibleness, gravity, sincerity. Be sound in speech that cannot be condemned. In other words, you don't have filthy jokes. You don't have filthy language coming out of your mouth. You have sound speech, clean speech, wholesome speech, speech that builds people's hearts up and not tears their lives down. Boy. Then he says that cannot be condemned, that he that is contrary, in other words, those lost people that are looking at your life, this is the heart of Christmas. God wants people saved, amen? That's what Christmas is about. It's a rescue story. And guess who God has chosen to use to save those who are lost? You, because you're his witness. Does not Acts chapter 1 verse 8 teach us that? You are my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. Not could be. No, you are a witness if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Boy, you are. Notice what it says though. Why? Why is it so important that you young men have sound speech that can't be condemned? That the contrary part, the lost, may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. In other words, they can't look at your life and say you're just a hypocrite. Like everybody else, I don't need to listen to your gospel. I don't need your Jesus. Boy. Look at verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient to their masters, to, be, to please them in all things, not answering again, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity or good behavior. 
Listen, why? That they may adorn. You see that? That they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. For the grace of God bringeth salvation that has appeared unto all men. Notice what it now you're going to see action, fruits, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no man despise thee. Boy. So I want to talk to you about the practical side of Christmas for the next few moments and dive in and see what God's word has to say for us concerning this subject. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us, and I pray now with all my heart that you'll touch me, you'll anoint me, you'll do in me and through me what I cannot muster on my own, and I pray with all my heart, Lord, that your word goes forth in power, that you'll open up our hearts and minds to receive it, to understand it, but Lord, more importantly, I pray that you'll use your word to transform us, to remind us, to help us remember how important Christmas truly, really is to you, and that Christmas is every single day of our life. Lord, there's one here that's lost. I pray that they repent and put their trust in your finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross, acknowledging they're a sinner, being willing to repent of their sin, and Lord, calling upon your name. And you tell us in Romans 10, all those that call upon your name shall be saved. Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is exactly what this book is all about. Man, it's about the practical side of Christmas. The book of Titus is an evangelistic letter that Paul wrote to this church, to Titus, in order, as he was on the island of Crete, in order to do what? Man, to build strong homes and to build and establish strong churches so that the gospel testimony of these churches would be effective at reaching the lost. That's what Christmas is all about, man, reaching the lost, amen? Boy, it is. Now, in Titus chapter 2, 14, the Bible says Jesus gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Why? Listen. Why? Ze so that we would be zealous for what? Good works. Do you see that? You see, there were false teachers that crept into these young churches that were barely established, and they were poisoning the witness of the gospel with their words and with their actions. And boy, it was creeping in like a cancer. So these false teachers threatened not only the spiritual lives of the believers that were there, but also the very salvation of those people that they were witnessing to because they were witnessing the wrong way. And man, Paul called him, or God called Paul to the island of Creek on his second missionary journey to help strengthen and establish these churches using the young man, this young pastor, Titus, to do that very thing. Boy, now God knows and Paul knows that the saving truth of the gospel message falls on deaf ears. Listen now. When those proclaiming to live the gospel live ungodly lives and show no evidence of redemption or salvation in their lives whatsoever. You know my testimony. I went around saying I was saved. I said the sinner's prayer six times with tears in my eyes between the age of 13 and 23, and I was still lost. And yet I had the gospel down. I knew it wasn't by good works or church membership. It was through Christ and Christ alone. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except through me. Did you notice that Jesus said me? He didn't say me and the church, me and baptism, me and good works, me and anything else. He said, no, it's through me and me alone. Amen? Boy. Hmm. But those that proclaim it, if they live ungodly lives and show no evidence of salvation, then that was me. That's why my dad sat me down with tears in his eyes and said, Dave, you preach the gospel better than I do. But I want you to know I see no evidence, zero fruit of salvation in your life. I see none. I don't see Christ in you at all. I need to hear that because I didn't have Christ in me at all. And God showed me that it was my unwillingness to repent of sin. You see, I wanted my party in one hand and I wanted Jesus in the other and it doesn't work that way. It's a total surrender of your life. It's a total repentance of sin and self and a turning to the Lord and surrendering your heart and totally trusting and relying on him to save your soul. Amen? Amen. Boy, 
One of the most compelling testimonies that a Christian can give is that of the adorning of Christ, Christ living his life in and through you. Man, putting on that adorning of holiness, remembering that it's the righteousness that God gave to you as a gift. He took your sin and as a gift to you, he gave to you freely his gift of righteousness and implanted that into your life permanently. So he no longer sees a condemned sinner, but he sees a righteous saint who's a son and a daughter of him. Amen? Boy, selflessness, self-giving, loving. That's why Paul wrote in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Christ gave himself to do what? Man, to cleanse us, to purify us, to redeem us so that we would be zealous for good works. We would be reflection of the character and nature of Christ who dwells in us by the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Boy. When kids look at their dad and mom and give them that great compliment, I want to be just like you when you grow up. A Christian mom or dad should look at that child and say, no, I'm the last person that you want to be like. You need to grow up and be like Christ. Let Christ dwell in your heart. Let Christ live his life in you. He is the one that you're to emulate. He is the one you're to look up to. He is the one that you're to give all of your heart to. Amen? Boy, he's the one that lives his life in and through you. You can't live the Christian life. Baptists, forget that. It's Christ who lives his life in you and through you. Amen? Boy. And this is the overall arching theme of this book. Don't expect unbelievers to heed the saving message of Jesus Christ if you as a Christian want to live in open sin or contrary to what the Word of God teaches us. You see, our God, Jesus Christ, man, he's a saving God, is he not? He saves people in order that their lives can be changed so that the lost world can see Man, Christ made a difference in your life. You used to be like this, but now you're like that. What, what's changed about you? Well, let me tell you and brag on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that changed my heart. Amen? Amen? Boy. God's given us a testimony of a transformed life. That's what people are looking for. Amen? Boy, that's why God said in Titus chapter 2.10, not pilfering, in other words, stealing, or in other words, having good conduct that they, lost people, may adorn. Man, they may admire man, the gospel of God. Man, they may admire the Lord Jesus Christ who is at work in you and through you. Why would God want us to be zealous for good works? Man, not only to be a benefit and a blessing to you, but a benefit and blessing to the body of Christ and to this lost world. Amen? Boy. And that's what Christmas is all about, man. Every single day you should be shining with the light of Christ. Boy, you don't want people seeing you. You want people seeing Christ. That's why he said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Wow. What's the number one thing that you hear lost people say they don't come to church? Well, there's a bunch of what? Bunch of hypocrites down there, Brother Dave. Well, you know the old saying, well, hey, brother, we got what we got room for one more, amen? <laughs> Boy, who's not? Who's not? Boy, who, who lives the Christian life perfectly on this planet? Only one person has, and he's in heaven now, and that's the Lord Jesus, amen? That's why Ecclesiastes says there's not a good man or a good person that continuously doeth good. That's why we got to confess our sins to maintain that fellowship, that sweetness with the Lord. Amen? Now, we don't confess our sins to maintain our relationship. No. Once you're truly saved, you're saved forever. Amen? Amen. Boy, but that's the question. Are you truly saved? It's not a hope so, a think so, a 99% so salvation. No, God's given us a no so salvation. These things I've written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. Not just that verse. These things are talking about the whole book of 1 John. It's a test to see whether or not you're genuinely born again. That's the greatest assignment in your life is to make sure that you know that you know that you know for a fact, biblically, that you're saved. Amen? Amen. Name one thing more important than that. That's what I thought. Amen? Boy. But there's some truth to what those hypocrites or those, those, those oh, the hypocrites and well, there's some truth to that, unfortunately, is there not? Boy.
Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, again, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Boy, as you study the life of Paul, you're going to notice one main principle about Paul. Now, he went to the island of Crete. Titus, his name, is mentioned about nine different times in this book. He went there on his missionary journey with Paul. He hung out with Paul also uh, when he gave that contribution to Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was in need, he was a part of that as well. So Paul knows this young man, and he's building him up. He's establishing him. But as you study Paul's life, one can be blind and still see it. People like to use the term, I've committed myself to Christ. Now, I understand what people mean by that, and I'm not going to beat people up. I, I know what they mean by that. However, I want to be true to the Bible. Amen? I do. You see, people like to use the term, I've committed myself to Christ, or uh, commit your life to Christ, and he'll save you. And I understand what they mean, but Paul didn't live a committed life to Christ. He lived a surrendered life to Christ. Big difference between being committed to someone or something than being surrendered to someone or something. Amen? Big difference. Boy, people that commit themselves to someone can uncommit themselves to someone. That's why there's divorce. You see, commitment depends on the strength, the power of the person, and their willpower. And guys, the Bible says put no, no, no trust, nothing, no strength in the flesh whatsoever. Amen? You'll fail every time. Boy, But if a person surrenders themselves to someone, then they're totally in the power and mercy of that person, are they not? You see, I can commit myself to fight the enemy, but then I can uncommit myself to run away and not fight. But if I surrender myself to the enemy, I'm totally at their mercy, am I not? You see, man, the Christian life is a total surrender to the Lord. That's the practical side of Christmas, surrendering your life every single day, daily, hourly, to the Lord and to his working power in you, the Holy Spirit. That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's a commandment. And do you realize that God gives us so much grace in that verse? Because it sounds like you have to do something in order to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. But when you look in the Greek, it literally is in the middle voice. And man, the Holy Spirit is acting on us. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the Holy Spirit wants to be in control of your life. All you have to do is acknowledge that and allow him to do it. Amen? Boy, he gives us so much mercy. You don't have to read your Bible and say, witness, I read my Bible, check. I went to church today, check. Now I can be filled. No, he wants to be in control of your life all the time. Amen? That's grace. That's mercy, is it not? Boy, that'll set you free. Those that have that Martha spirit, boy, we get all tied up in what we do. And God says, no, it's not about doing more. It's about trusting more. Amen? Boy. Now, this book basically is divided into three parts. I'm going to keep this brief. Chapter 1 deals with the qualifications of leadership. And so he's saying, hey, listen, this is what I want Christmas to look like every day in a pastor's life. And he gives the qualifications. He's dealing with leaders, but then in chapter 2, he focuses on the character and conduct of laymen in the church. And so he's saying, hey, listen, as a church, I want you to look and be this way so that when your community looks at you, they're not going to see carnality. They're going to see Christ. Amen? And this is how leaders and laymen are to get along. This is what Christ is to look like in a leader in a layman's life working together. Are you with me? Why? Because chapter 3 is summed up in a dealing with the lost. Why? Because leaders and laymen in churches are working to see the lost saved. Amen? What's the whole purpose of Jesus coming? I've come to seek and to what? Disciple everybody? Is that what it says? I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen? Boy, when a church loses that priority, man, the church is off the rails. Boy. Now, discipleship is equally important, don't get me wrong. But the priority, first and foremost, who comes first, a disciple or a lost person? You can't have a disciple unless you what, evangelize to them first, amen? That's why evangelism is the priority. If you made an appointment with two people, one was lost, one was saved, and God said, hey, listen, they're both going to die in an hour. One's going to hell, one's going to heaven. 
but you double booked I need you to cancel one of your appointments what appointment would you cancel the save why because he's saved and Jesus left the 99 and went after the what the one are you glad that you were the one praise the Lord amen boy he loves you so much today and every day loves you the same amen boy now the gospel of Jesus Christ centers around a what a tree does it not a tree that was on Mount Calvary so if the gospel is a Christmas tree if you will then Jesus Christ is the light at the top of that tree would you agree amen now God the Father decorated that tree the real Christmas tree Calvary's tree with the worst of humanity Every single sin that every single person ever would commit from Adam to the last person to be born, every wrong action, every wrong word, attitude, deed, intent, and motive of their heart, every single bit of it was dumped on Jesus Christ and God's wrath fell on Christ so that it would not fall on us. Amen? Amen. So we could have heaven as our home. Boy. So understand that. It was decorated with our sin. It was decorated with the worst of humanity. Now, we put presents under our tree in honor to remember the Lord's birth. But, man, the Lord, God the Father, put the greatest gift of all, not under a tree, but he put them on a tree. Calvary's tree. Amen? Boy, praise God for the grace and mercy that he gives. Amen? Boy, the cross of Christ, God's Christmas tree, before it could be brilliant, it had to be made bland first. And boy, was it not bland with humanity's sin? How dark was that? It was the darkest black that you've ever seen, amen? Boy. You see, when you buy a Christmas tree, it comes bland before it becomes brilliant, amen? Boy. We put ornaments on Christmas trees to make them beautiful. To make that which is plain and make it pleasant. But the greatest and true Christmas tree is not going to be found in your house this Christmas season. No, the greatest Christmas tree of all is found on Mount Calvary in Jerusalem. Amen? Boy, that's where the greatest Christmas tree of all was. Christ decorates his body. He adorns us with himself. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me will bear much fruit. Christmas and the practical side of it is bearing fruit for the Lord so that you're a reflection of him so that people can say hey he does make a difference he did transform your life man he is on the throne man he exists he is real amen am I up here by myself I know I'm not boy Christ does not decorate your life with beautiful ornaments of plastic and glass. Now, what does the Lord Jesus truly adorn your life with when you come to know him? Because this is what Christmas is all about, man. Boy, what does he adorn your life with? Boy, he adorns your life with what? Man, a transformed life. He, man, he turns you from a sinner into a saint. Did he not? If you know him today, boy. And you went from being sinful and bad to being a beacon of light. That's what he has adorned you with because of the marvelous, loving, awesome gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave to us. That's why the gospel should never get cold to you. Man, it's the greatest rescue story of all. Man, it's the greatest love that God has for you. Amen? Wow. Man, don't ever let that get cold to you. And don't ever let it be put you down for sharing the gospel. You, know, you just preach on salvation. Well, you better believe I do, brother. Amen? Boy, that's what Jesus is all about. Salvation for all. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Boy, man, he adorned your life when it was lifeless to giving you life everlasting. From damnation to, man, everlasting life. Boy, man, he ordained and or, or, he adorned your life with his grace and his peace and his power and his love, does he not? Boy, with his protection and his provision. Man, his care and correction, his hope and his help. Boy, he takes all of his sufficiency and takes all of your inefficiencies and swallows them up. That's what he adorns your life with. Amen. Boy, he clothes your weakness with his greatness. 
He takes all of our impossibilities and makes them possibilities. Boy. He takes all of our losses. And Paul said, everything that we used to work for was food that perished. And do you know what he called it in the book of Philippians? He said, man, you're working and striving to get on top of a dunghill. You see the one that owns it all? The guy that has the most toys, the biggest house, the most fame, the most money, the most education, the most of the most that the world offers? Do you realize that guy is standing on top of a dunghill compared to Christ and knowing him as your Lord and Savior? Amen? Boy, they're working for the food that perishes. That's why Jesus said, don't work for the food that perishes, but work for the food that does it. And that's me putting your trust in my work, my finished work on Calvary's cross for your soul. That's how you get saved. Amen? Boy. He takes all of our imperfections and adorns us with his perfection. He takes all of our losses and turns them into gains. He took us who chose to be victims of sin and turned us into the greatest victors of all because we're more than conquerors in Christ, the Bible says. Amen? Boy. Wow. We're not to be ornaments of darkness, but ornaments of light. Ephesians 5, 8 says this, For you were sometimes darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So we're not to be ornaments of sin, and worldliness because you're either going to be a living ornament for Christ. Do you realize that you're a living ornament for Christ? And that Christ wants to adorn you? That's why he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Your old man is dead. Consider it dead to the world. Amen? Man, Christ has set you free from the power of sin, the love of sin, the habit of sin, according to Romans chapter 6. We're living for him now. Amen? Boy. Because you're either going to reflect the characteristics of Christ in your life or you're going to reflect and be an ornament of carnality in your life. Who are you reflecting, Christ or carnality? Self and sin, which is related to Satan, amen? A relationship with self is a relationship right next to sin and Satan. That's why Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up your cross, death to self, death to who you are, death to your will, death to your dreams. I'm living for Christ. That's why the Bible says, man, he bought you with the price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and soul, which are his. You don't own you anymore. He owns you by right of creation. He owns you by right of redemption. Amen? These feet don't get to go where you want to anymore. You don't get to look at what you want to anymore. You don't get to handle what you want to anymore. You don't get to go where you want to anymore. Why? Because you're living for his will, his desire. Amen? Amen. Boy. Look at verse 10. I want to show you something. Look at verse 10. This is great. Boy, I love this verse. But showing all good fidelity. Now notice what it says. That you may adorn. Look at that word. That you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. This is the key to this whole book. Showing the world that when God saves a person, he changes that person from the inside out. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, behold, he's a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. Are you with me? Now that word adorn in the Greek, listen to this, is cosmeo. It's where we get our words cosmetic from, ladies. And what does cosmetics mean? In the Greek, it means to arrange. It means to put in order. It means to ornament. It means to arrange something in its proper order to give it symmetry, to give it comeliness or beauty. It was a word used in ancient times of brooches, necklaces, crowns, and jewels, and to arrange them in such a way that it struck the maximum light so they could reflect the maximum beauty. That's what jewelers use, and that's what that word cosmetic means. Well, Paul here is not referring to physical jewelry or makeup to help one look more attractive. He's talking about spiritual makeup. And what's that spiritual makeup, Brother Dave, that helps us look attractive to the world? That is putting on Christ, realizing that it's Christ who lives his life in and through you. Amen? That's why Philippians says, it's God who is at work in you. 
both to will and do his good pleasure. He gives you the desire to do it, and then he gives you the ability and the will to do it because he's empowering you. Amen? That's what we got to remember so that we don't get burnt out and realize it's a life of trusting. It's a life of surrender to the Lord. Boy. Verse 5 of Titus says that the word of God be not what? Blasphemed. Amen. See, when I get up in the morning, there's a certain steps that I go through. You have your quiet time. Then you look in the mirror, and then I praise God that my wife is blind. Amen. <laughs> right? But if you got bad head, you do something about it. You arrange yourself to look more what? Attractive. When you're having your quiet time, and God begins to show you things about your life that are not very attractive, you have your time in the mirror of God's word, and you begin to allow God to rearrange things in your life before you present yourself to the public and to your friends and your family. Amen? Is that not what practical Christmas is all about? Boy, it is. Man, oh, man. Now, let me just say this. Because one person really pointed it out, and I agree with him a million percent, because this is crucial to understand at this point in the sermon. Now, as you go through Paul, and you look at what Paul is saying, he is not, let me say what Paul is not saying about these verses and about making you more attractive. Listen to this. He's not saying that we can improve on the doctrine of God, the Word of God, or Jesus Christ himself. You can't improve on them, amen? He's perfect. So we're not talking about improving on the word of God. You can't make Jesus any more beautiful than he already is. He's perfect in every way. Amen? Boy, but he wants to make you perfect and he wants to conform you, as Corinthians says, into the image of his son. That's what he's doing to, with you on a daily basis. Understand this. And it's not a cliche saying. But God truly is more interested in working in you and on you and on your heart and your character then is what he can do through you. Does God need Dave Unger to preach? As my good friend John Reed would say, God can raise up a drunk under a bridge and they can preach better than Billy Graham. Amen? God doesn't need Dave Unger. I need him. Amen? Boy. You know, trying to improve on Jesus or improve on the Word of God would be like saying, let's make the water wetter. You can't do it, amen? Boy. But if we're going to be made to adore Christ and have Christ adorning on our hearts and lives, we need to be filled with the Spirit. Why? So that people don't abhor the doctrine of God, but they adore the doctrine of God. Even though they may disagree with it, they can't walk away and say, man, I know something about you. They may not like it. That's why the Bible says in Corinthians that some people, when you witness to them, you're a sweet-smelling Savior. Boy. But then it says to others, you're an aroma of death. And the picture that God was giving there in Corinthians was a processional. When Rome would conquer a country, they would take all the people they conquered and all the kings and make them march ahead of the Roman soldiers and the Roman Caesar. And so, boy, this big procession would come in and people would begin to throw rose petals. And that rose petals were so much of them, they would smell that aroma. Now, to the victors behind all these slaves that they captured and their enemies, boy, that rose smell was a swell of victory. But to all those that were captive, they knew where they were marching to. They were marching to their death. And God says, you're going to be an ornament of death? Or you'll be an ornament of light, an aroma of life when you share the gospel with people. It's so important that God is emphasizing, listen, it's not just you knowing how to share the gospel and sharing it brilliantly. No. It's not just knowing how to share the gospel correctly, but what he's saying to us for three chapters is making sure that your conduct backs up your walk and your talk. Amen. Your talk matches your walk, in other words. Amen. Boy, that's what he's saying to us. God's makeup is Jesus Christ himself. The way that we put on God's makeup in our life is by submitting our way for his. And by yielding our will for his word. Boy, by giving 
uh, daily control of our lives to his control of our lives. Man, literally, sometimes you may not feel like doing something, maybe in ministry, you may, you just feel burnt out. You know what you say, Lord, I feel burnt out. Man, my flesh doesn't want to do it. But Lord, I know it's your will, and I'm asking you to replace that with your strength, replace that with your might, replace that with your will, replace that with your desire. Because Lord, if you don't, I'm going to walk around like an anchor. God wants his will for your life more than you can want it for yourself. Do you believe that? Boy, he does. He loves you with all of his heart. Amen? Boy. Ladies and gentlemen, look at verse 10. It sums up what Christian life is supposed to be. God wants you and I to be living commercials for Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't take people immediately home to heaven when they get saved? Because verse 10 tells us, listen, you're my living ornament. I'm going to adorn you. I'm going to conform you into the image of my son. It's called sanctification. Now, some people grow quicker than others. People are at different levels spiritually, amen? But we're never going to preach perfection. No, sir, because the Bible says that when you get born again, you're not going to be sinless, but you will sin less when you get born again. Amen? amen. Boy. Yes, indeed. Why? Because Christ is living his life in and through you. Amen? Boy. Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. Did you hear what he said? It's the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation. Did he say it's Dave Unger's illustrations? It's Dave up there sweating and stomping and spitting? That saves people? Is that what he said? He said it's the foolishness of preaching that saves those who believe. Amen? God says preaching is foolishness to them. Boy. God said it's the gospel. So not only does the gospel need to be shared, but man, you need to be adorned in such a way and realize that, listen, the most precious thing that God gave to you on this planet, that is priceless, priceless. Do you know what that is? It's your testimony. God-given, God-honoring testimony. Ain't one thing more powerful than that. Why? Because your life, because Christ is living in you, when people see his reflection on your life, and you share the gospel, man, hey, there is something different about her or him. I've watched them. They got a supernatural peace that I don't have. I like the way their life looks. It's very attractive to me. That's why Jesus said in Psalm 23, he prepares a table before our enemies. Why does he do that? To make them jealous and envious? No. To show that he takes care of his own. Don't you know, old man, that it's the forbearance and the kindness and the patience of the Lord that leads a man to repentance? That's how God melted my heart. I needed to hear hell, and I needed to hear I was going there forever because I was. And so is everyone else that doesn't repent and give their heart to Jesus. Amen. I needed to hear that. But you know what melted my heart? When Jesus came to me with that illustration of that dog that that guy took in, and he would take in all those starving dogs, spend all that money on them, and then give them to a couple that would take care of them. He goes, but those dogs would bite my hand sometimes. And that was, boy, that's how God really broke my heart. I remember saying to myself, if I took a dog in like that, 23 years old, at Westside Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, I'd get rid of that dog in a heartbeat. Going to treat me that way? After here, I'm trying to take care of you. You're going to bite my hand? Uh-uh. Get, get out of my house. And the Lord spoke to my heart and thought. Not a word. Didn't hear it. Didn't have any hocus pocus or anything weird or funny. It was just a piercing thought that went through my head. And that thought was, you're that dog, Dave. And I've been reaching my hand down to you for 23 years, and all you do is rebel, rebel, rebel boy and he melted me with his love and just showed me man how gracious and Lord, yes Dave it's me that's been keeping your heart beating it's me that's kept breath in your lungs it's me that put a roof over your head it's me that gave you airman of the month airman of the quarter and airman of the year it's me doing all that for you not you boy he got my attention and John 3 16 was no longer a banner at a football game it was real and that Jesus Christ truly died for you and he died for me. And he's in it for keeps. And so is Satan. And that's why your testimony is so precious. 
Well, Brother Dave, I've blown it from my family. They call me a hypocrite right now. Then there's nothing I can do. Oh, yes, there is something you can do. You know what you do? You go back to your family and say, you know what? You're right. If I were to look at my life, I'd, I would say that I wasn't a Christian either. By the way, I've been acting in some of the stuff I did and said. And I want you to know I'm deeply and truly sorry for that. And I've asked God to help me repent. Will you pray for me? Boy, that's how you get your testimony back with your family. Amen? By coming clean and being honest and sharing your testimony. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed as the piano is about to play. These altars are going to be open. We're going to stand in just a few seconds. If there's anybody here today that would say, Brother Dave, I'm lost. And God's revealed to me that I truly need to repent. I need to turn from my sin and put all my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, saving work on the cross. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that you're saved by grace, his unconditional love. You don't merit his favor. He gives it to you unconditionally. You're saved by grace through faith. That means putting your trust in God's word. And God says, believe on the Lord Jesus. Trust in him, his work that he paid in full for you on Calvary's cross and took care of every single sin from the time you were born to the time that you died. He paid for it in full. All of God's wrath fell on him so that it wouldn't fall on you. Have you repented of your sin? Do you know Jesus Christ in a real way? Now, guys, this, Jesus didn't say I'm the way, the truth, and a ticket. I realize that preaching on hell can be very scary. And I walked down an aisle a couple times, and I got and I, I got scared, but I didn't get saved. It's not, Lord Jesus, save me. I don't want to go to hell. It's, Lord Jesus, I don't want my sin, and I don't want to go to hell. Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm trusting in your finished work on the cross. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. I'm trusting in what you did. Have you done that? If you haven't done that, I'm going to invite you to say, Brother Dave, I want you to pray for me. I want to be saved today. No one looking around. If God's revealed to you that you're lost, I'll not call on you. I'll not embarrass you. I just want you to raise your hand so I can acknowledge you. Brother Dave, I want to be saved today. Raise your hand right now. Brother Dave, I want to be saved today. Anybody at all? All right, church. How's your walk with the Lord? Is it a checklist? Man, I'm going to church, check. Take notice of me, Lord. I can feel not guilty now. Lord, I read my Bible, check. Lord, I did this, check, check. Is it a check mark? Is it a checklist? Or are you meeting with the one that loves you, that died for you, that cares for you, that says cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you? Are you pouring your heart out to them? Are you praying for lost loved ones? Are you inviting lost people to church to hear the gospel? These altars are going to be open. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Maybe some of you need to pray for your family. Maybe there's some saying, Brother Dave, you know, I've been praying about a church and I, I believe that God's led me to join this church. I can tell you how you can be a part of our church. If everyone would stand to their feet, we'll not tarry. 416, if you'd like to sing along, come. This is your time and God's time. Come.
may be seated just for a second. Thank you so much for your patience. Well, this is uh, our dear brother Bob and Christine James, and we have known them. We have talked to them about their testimonies as well. Uh, brother George and I have got with them, and uh, they have expressed a desire to join our church today. So all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. Absolutely. I'm going to have them in the back with me, so I want you to extend your hand to fellowship with them and let them know that you're excited about joining our church, that you're going to pray for them. If there's anything you can do for them, please let them know. Amen? Amen. You two young ladies, I want to say what a blessing you guys were to us this morning. Thank you guys so much for being here again. Amen? Did such a great job. Thank you, praise team. I'm going to have my dear brother Brad close us in prayer. I'm going to have Sister